Welcome, ladies and gentlemen. Uh, welcome to this first event of the CIUM Confucius Institute series of activities, lectures, performances, and exhibitions. So, uh, before I introduce our distinguished lecturer today, let me just say two things. Uh, first, uh, we really have a fantastic program prepared for you guys uh, this fall. So I'm not going to talk too much about events far in the future. But next week, we have a whole week of Chinese culture, arts, and festival. So there will be movies and lectures on uh, Asian Chinese philosophy. But the highlight of next week is the dance of contemporary Chinese dance, left and right. And, and believe me, that is cutting edge Chinese contemporary dance, which uh, we flew in the, uh, the artist from Beijing Direct. And it's the kind of show that's creating a buzz in Beijing. And if you uh, want to see that in Beijing, hopefully you can find other tickets. And here we do it for you free. So, but just make sure you come well in Anderson. So that would that is a fantastic good talk. And in surrounding that, you look at the fire in the back, so you will find a lot of lectures, quite a couple of lectures and dance uh, workshop surrounding that very important performance. So make sure to say next week at least Saturday evening for that fantastic dance performance. And then uh, a little bit. Uh, another week further down, we will have a troupe of very uh, special musicians from the Central Conservatory uh, to perform for us a very interesting program of Chinese and Western music. So as you all know, the Central Conservatory of Music is really the top music school of China. Actually, in the world, one of the best in the world, comparable to Julia. And so make sure you uh, bring your friends along to come to enjoy that wonderful concert too. So and then for the rest, I'll let you uh, look at the brochure and see all these fantastic programs we've done for you. Now, uh, today we have a fantastic good speaker, Kenneth, uh, Professor Kenneth uh, Michael Swole. He is a distinguished alum, one of the, our most uh, celebrated, very product productive alum. So he got his PhD from the History Department in 2001. And now he currently is the General Woodford Blonde Professor of Military History at the University of Southern Mississippi. That's quite an honor. And also, beginning right now, he is going to serve as a, a fellow at the School of Historical Studies at the Institute for Advanced Studies at Princeton University. That is, again, as we all know, historians uh, are very uh, distinguished the position of fellowship. And also, I, I, I suppose the Mississippians like him very much because they just chose him to be the College of Arts and Letters Researcher of the Year, so it's very fantastic. And, of, and then, of course, in 2010, President Swope won the ACLS, American Council of Learning Society, uh, Research Fellowship too. So that is all major grants. Now, he is very productive, so I'm not going to read the titles of all his papers, but he has three books, uh, two, has, two have already come out. The first one uh, is uh, 2009, it's called The Dragon's Head and the Servant's Tail, Ming China and the First Great East Asian War, 1592 to 1598. I always admire uh, Ken's book titles, paper titles, he always has a flame with very eye-catching, ear-catching titles. <laughs> and I think that's the first step of good paper, good scholarship, it's a good title. The second book, uh, which came out last year from Rowledge, is called The Military Collapse of, Ming, of China's Ming Dynasty, 1618 to 1644. So that, again, is a fantastic title and good uh, story. And the next book I know is coming in two years' time, will be On the Trail of the Yellow Tiger, War, Trauma, and social dislocation in southwest China through the Ming Qing transition. So all these are very current and very uh, creative and pioneer topics. As we all now know, we have a very turbulent life and society, so all these papers will give us a dynamic understanding of war, violence, and <coughs> the not so pleasant side of the man, but his part of the man. So without further ado, Professor. Thanks so 
much. It's great to be here. It's always great to come back to Michigan. Uh, a beautiful fall day. And when, uh, football Saturday, no less, coming up. And so I've got my tickets to the game. So <laughs> I will be enjoying it. I was hoping Coach Harbaugh was going to show up. But I, mean, I guess he's getting ready for tomorrow, so we'll just have to watch the video, right? which I'm sure he will do. And, uh, but it's going to be here. And so today I'm going to talk a little bit about my uh, new book project that I'm working on. Now at Princeton, and I've been doing research for the last year and a half or so, two years, and um, sort of connect some of the stuff I've been finding in Chinese history, make some generalizations, to sort of tie it into military history more broadly, and um, lessons that we can learn from the Chinese experience that are both specific to Chinese culture and to the Ming transition, but also more broadly to uh, study military history. And as a faculty member at the Dale Center for the Study of War and Society in Southern Miss, one of the things we do is to try and bring that human experience of warfare into our research and sort of study the impact that war has on people at all levels of society, from, from you know, ancient warfare all the way up to the present. And so you know, the research I'm doing is kind of informed by that, the interactions of my colleagues, teaching, etc. So um, I'm going to talk a little bit about sources and historiography today, uh, talk about a few historical figures, reviews, passages from some of the primary sources. But uh, to keep things moving along and not bore you to death, there will also be plenty of pictures <laughs> and images. And, and so you'll get to see what I did with General Buford Blunt's money this summer, uh, traveling around China to various sites associated with the Ming Chin transition and the infamous peasant rebel Zhang Shenzhong, we talked about this image in a second. So, so we start with a quote from one of the primary sources of the Ming Chin transition. Chaos is not born from chaos, but is born from order. Order is not born from order, but is born out of chaos. Without great chaos, one cannot have great order. Well, it you know, sounds like the start of an epic, a comic book, you know, a superhero movie or something. And uh, and very interesting, because this is the very first line of his, his journal, his memoirs, that sort of chronicle what happens in uh, Sichuan, in southwest China, during the Ming Qing transition. And um, this particular um, source was compiled by his son, a few decades later, but there are similar quotes I'm going to read that come from some of the other sources. But it's great because you get a sense by, by seeing quotes like this, you get a sense of the perspective of the author, and I'm going to get into that a little more later, but how some of the stories, you know, the horrific stories of hardship, starvation, cannibalism, tiger attacks, and all these other things, but then they often come back to some sort of moral or lesson. And that you must experience this hardship to appreciate security and peace. And in some cases, it's security and peace provided by the Qing, because they've taken over and they've provided peace. In other cases, the Qing were the problem. And it was peaceful and happy under the Ming. And um, in some cases, it was all that. And so it's interesting to sort of read the sources and try to pick out the perspectives of the different actors. And, and I'm also going to talk a little bit about some of the modern perspectives, because certainly these events have gotten a lot of coverage in modern historiography, modern scholarship in China especially from the 50s with the emphasis on studying kinds of rebellions and studying these historical figures. And even you know, into the present day, the last few decades, or the last few years even, uh, several books have come out studying the Ming Peasant Rebels and the Ming Peasant Rebellions. And they're not quite as overtly political as they once were in the early years of now, but they're, they're quite interesting in the way that they kind of portray events and the significance of events and individuals. And we'll talk about that as we go forward. So. So um, in terms of the broader project that I'm working on, um, essentially this is a sequel to the last book, which is about the military collapse of the Ming. And what happened was when I was doing the research for that book, and I had all this material on the sort of fall of Sichuan at the end of the Ming dynasty and that sort of what happened to the peasant rebels who retreated into Sichuan as the Manchus were moving into uh, northeast China and taking Beijing. And I wanted to include that material in the last book. But the book was already long. Uh, it was already over the length that the publishers wanted. And I realized that there was so much good material that I should just write another book. <laughs> and, and so I had enough stuff that I was like, OK, well, great. I can write an entire book about this. And as it's turned out, I'm already worried that this book is going to be too long, too. <laughs> and, um, and I've got plans for the next sequel. Um, and so it sort of it spun out of doing research and finding multiple sources that were just 
really rich, and I realized that it wouldn't do them justice to just have a single chapter kind of like, okay, and this is what happened to these poor people in the next 20 years in Southwest China, but that there was a lot of material that I could draw on. And I was actually inspired by the recent work of um, Diana Larry and Steve McKinnon and um, Keith Shopa uh, concerning the uh, Kangar Zhanjiang, the World War II in China, and the work on trauma and survivors and how people remember war and how they experience war. And uh, some of the insights and, and uh, findings of theirs were, were quite interesting. I was like, wow, I could take some of this material, trauma studies, memory studies, and I could apply it to the 17th century because we have the records. And that's unusual around the world. You don't know, usually have the kind of documentary record that you have in China in the early modern period. And, um, and, I, and not only did I have records, but I have from both sides. I've got, and I'll talk about that in a minute, but I've got Ming stuff, I've got Qing stuff, I've got you know, semi-independent stuff, you have private histories, official histories. And so the record was such that I figured I could do this. And so that's sort of what I decided to do with this project, is actually get into the resistance of the uh, Ming loyalists, as well as these independent warlords who sprung up, and um, look at how ordinary people in southwest China um, primarily looking at Sichuan, Yunnan, Guangxi, and Guizhou. And because that's where that sort of southern main port of Yongli was, was centered, and that's where the main resistors were. And um, focus on that area, because as some of the sources say, this is the area that was longest affected. In fact, of course, it's affected later by the Sanfan Rebellion. Um, and and you know, the most intense fighting and, and the sort of the political changes and, and things that go on there were perhaps the, the greatest of any area in China. And so um, you know, that's why I decided to take that approach and look at that part of the country. And then it fits sort of nicely in terms of chronology. I'm going from essentially the fall of Beijing, 1644, to 1664, when uh, Li Laihan, who was one of the adopted sons of the of China, he's finally killed by the Manchus in the mountains of Huguan in uh, what is now Western China. And so uh, I'll show you that in a second. So, uh, so in terms of significance, that's what I'm hoping to do, is actually bring the study of trauma and memory to the 17th century by using these sources and then drawing insights that we can use for other, other places and times. So um, most of you, or at least a lot of you, probably already know this, and um, it, it will be on the test. <laughs> but, um, <laughs> all the dates, you know, just a few key dates are here. Um, the fall of Beijing, Qing taken in June. Southern Ming, the first Southern Ming regime was established in Nanjing right after that. Zhang Shenzhong, we'll be talking about quite a bit more today. He sets himself up in the summer of 1644 in, uh, in Chengdu, after, after he captured Chongqing first, and then the Qing uh, take Nanjing, and then the Southern Ming resistance in the Southwest is you know, 1640s through 1664. And one of the significant things about these dates, and the reason I put them up, is that Zhang Shenzhong, in traditional sources, is often blamed for a lot of the bloodshed and devastation that happens in southwest China. In fact, the official history of the Ming Dynasty claims that Zhang Shenzhong killed 600 million people. <laughs> um, and so, I, you know, I know you're not all experts in Chinese demography, but that would be roughly three times the population of the entire Ming Dynasty. <laughs> so, as effective as his, his killers may have been, they did not kill 600 million people. Um, I actually think it, it makes sense to say it was 600,000. Um, it's just a sort of decimal error. That could be a, an estimate because the population of Sichuan was about 4 million. That would be about a sixth of the population. And I think that figure actually does make a little bit of sense. I'm going to talk about some other numbers uh, later. But we don't know for sure. I mean, there's no way to tell. And um, despite the fact that they have found some mass graves, in fact, in 2002 in Chengdu, they found a grave that they call the 10,000 person grave of a bunch of people that have been massacred in the Ming Qing transition. Um, and it was in the news, it was Chinese news. And, 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 um, but uh, they weren't, they never determined if it was John who killed these people or if it was the Qing or perhaps Wu San Wei. And there were a number of candidates for the slaughter in question. And there were many slaughters in question, so it's, it's hard to say which ones. Even some of John's defenders will say, well, he only killed those 15,000 scholars at one time. <laughs> and, um, so you really can't blame him for everything. But the point here is that looking at the dates, John Shenzhong himself was killed in 1647, beginning of 1647. So if you have this massive demographic shift and you know, bloodshed and disease, all these people dying, 
he couldn't have died, right? He was dead. So, so, but the Qing was still alive. So some of the sources really emphasize what the Qing did. In fact, that one account says there was no evil the Qing troops did not commit when they went rape, plunder, looting, you know, anything went as far as the Qing were concerned. And of course, it's the pro Ming source, right? To explain why there was so much loyalty to the Ming. And others will say, well, it's all the peasant workers. Oh, it's local warlords. So it's really interesting to kind of get into that. So that's going to give you a, a sense of the whole chronological scope. Okay, and uh, map of China, which again, most of you probably don't need, but uh, the area that I'm looking at for this study is really, you know, obviously that one. Sichuan, Yenan, Guangxi, and Huizhou. Uh, so down, down in here in the southwest. And a little bit into uh, what, what in the Ming times was Huguang, I guess we know who they have, but the eastern part of Huguang. And, um, so one of the things that um, we've really benefited from in terms of uh, you know, studying this period are the sheer number and depth and breadth of the source materials that have survived. And when you're talking about dynastic transition, right, the Ming Qing transition looms large in you know, traditional historiography and modern history for a number of reasons. I mean, obviously, it's very dramatic, a lot of colorful characters, um, lots of great stories, you know, lots of heroes and villains. Um, we've benefited from the fact that there's, um, it's the most recent of the dynastic transitions, so we actually have a lot more source material. When I talk to my friends who study the Song dynasty or the Tang dynasty or something, they're always so jealous because we Ming historians have a ton of material to work with. And it's different types of material. I mean, starting in the mid Ming, there was a real explosion of unofficial histories and private histories written. And so a lot of the stuff that I'm using is that type of literature. I'm going to get a little more into sources in a bit. But um, so you've got the significance of the Ming Qing as the last dynastic transition, dynasty to dynasty, as opposed to becoming a republic. Um, you've also got the foreign dimension. The man chooses the foreign invaders and conquerors, and the sort of Chinese loyalism and, and defending the cause. And the modern historiography often plays this up when they talk about the union of the peasant rebel armies and the southern Ming forces and the Tusa, the aboriginal peoples. They say all the Chinese people banded together to resist foreign invaders. And you know, the minority peoples, and then you know, conveniently leaving out that, of course, they also call the Manchus Chinese. But that's, a, that's another point entirely. But it, it's very interesting to see how they talk about this union. And some people will use that to justify the you know, treatment of minorities in China today. We'll see in the Ming, they were all good friends. You know, the, the Tusa and the, the Ming fought together to resist the Manchus because the Tusa loved the Ming. Despite the fact that if you read the Ming records, there are always Aboriginal revolts all <laughs> over in Guizhou and Guna and these places. But some of these same people have revolted later, supported the Ming, I think, for often self-interested reasons. But, uh, but that's that's an interesting part of it in terms of significance. And so that's one of the things I'm looking at. Social and demographic change. Again, there's there's a lot of debate about this. Some people have argued, you know, as much as 50% of the Chinese population dies in the 17th century. Figures are Nowadays, people are generally going a little lower than that. But um, you know, in Sichuan, there are, there are accounts where they say 99% of the population died. So the contemporary sources say that. Nine out of 10 houses were empty, but 10 out of 10 graves were full, um, and uh, that sort of thing. So there are some really interesting statistics. But what we do know is that there were, you know, there, were, there was famine, there was epidemics, and there was a big demographic change. And so what happens is Sichuan seems to have gotten depopulated, and then people move into Sichuan in particular from Huguang and from Shanxi and from these other places. And then that in turn later spurs further Qing expansion and settlement to the west and into Central Asia. So that's not the key aspect of what I'm looking at, but that's sort of in the background of what's happening. And um, so I'm going to talk about that a, a little bit uh, as well. Uh, historiography, uh, in, in terms of that, as I mentioned earlier, the kind of modern situation you have initially spate of interest in the Southern Ming and the Peasant Rebellions with the founding of the, the PRC in 1949 for obvious reasons. And so, you know, some of the scholarship wasn't so good, some of it was really good. And if nothing else, they did a great job of compiling materials, historical materials that might otherwise have been lost or forgotten about the Ming Peasant Rebels. So we have all these great detailed reports from the, from the Qing archives and from, uh, from Ming sources and from private sources. And so the historiography has kind of changed over time. There used to be a lot of extolling the peasants and how they you know, fought the evil gentry and landlords for the sake of the people. 
Um, you know, nowadays you don't see that as much, although you still see a lot of defense of the as it relates to the Lee Zichang and Professor Richard Chen But you also see, as I mentioned, this discussion of loyalty, of Chinese unity against foreign invaders, of the sort of you know, working together, you know, different races, the Minzu working together to resist the foreign. And, and that comes out in so that. Um, in terms of the memory aspect, I think one of the interesting things, the last two sort of go together, is how Ming history, for whatever reason, has become very popular in China the last few years. And so if you go into any bookstore in the major cities, you find all these popular Ming histories, the Chao Nashi sure, and there are multiple volumes of this. These uh, scholars like Yan Chongnian have TV shows that are really popular. CCTV is publishing all these books of Ming history now and making TV programs about them. And so you see a lot of it kind of in the kind of popular mindset. And um, you know, people are like, oh yeah, Ming history is very interesting. And they know the figures and they know the characters. And there are all these sort of you know, novels I picked up. A couple of years ago, I picked up a novel about the Southern Ming. And, um, it's great. It's the first novel I've actually read from cover to cover in Chinese, um, because my Chinese was good enough to actually read it, because I knew all the figure, the characters, and I had enough of the vocabulary to actually read it, cover to cover. And it's about it, essentially the events of my book. And I'm like, this is great. I should steal material from this novel, <laughs> put it in my book, because um, yeah, just the way it describes it. But there's a lot of you know contemporary interest. I mentioned the uh, discovery of the, the grave or the mass grave in Chengdu, so you know that made the news. Um, there have been a number of publications, as I mentioned, in the last 10 years, a lot of publications about the Ming Desert Rebels as well, and, and military history in general in China. There was you know, a series of military history books that have been published recently. Um, when I was in uh, China this summer, I was in Sichuan, and going around, and people were telling us stories about Zhang Shenzhong as we would go, plus people who knew who he was, and it wasn't everybody. But a surprising number of cab drivers know something about <laughs> <laughs> Zhang Shenzhong. And including my, my personal cabbie that I'll tell you about more from Xichong County, who, who, who we became very close in the two days I was there. Um, but, and, and telling us folk tale about, well, why are you studying this guy? He hated us Sichuanese people, and we hate him. And, um, you know, he wanted to kill us all. You know, why would anybody want to study this guy? And I'm like, I'm not, I'm not his friend. I'm not his, <laughs> 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 trying to defend Zhang Xiang Zhou. Um, but, and, and so, um, you know, he, he told me, and I'll, I'll give you one example of one of these stories our cabbie told us. So this local legend from Xichong, which is the county where he was killed, he said John was, was traveling one day with the soldiers and had to relieve himself. And so he went off into the bushes and he forgot to bring them, you know, something to clean up with. So he grabbed some thorns, some bushes or something, like <coughs> thorns, and they scratched him. And he goes, he goes, man, even the plants in this province are vicious. <laughs> because the people are even worse. That's why I have to kill them all. <laughs> and, and, and this is a sort of local legend about Zhang Shenzhong and uh, Xichong County. So there's a lot of popular cultures. I'll show you a, another image later we'll talk about Li Dingo. But, uh, but so let's we not get bored, let's have a few pictures. Uh, and so this, is, it's a little bright here, but th this is the image outside. But this is a portrait, obviously, of Zhang Shenzhong. This is in the Military Museum in Beijing. So this is obviously a modern image, but most of the contemporary sources do describe him as looking pretty much like this. Tall guy, rugged, uh, you know, big long beard. If you read some of the sources, every time he makes a speech, he sweeps his beard to the side and gestures heroically. Um, of course, you know, his nickname, like the, the Yellow Tiger, was one of his nicknames from the time he was young. He had some childhood illness, and he had a yellow complexion. And he was really vicious. So again, as the Ming Shur says, John, from the time he was young, he liked killing and beating up people. And if a day went by and he didn't kill somebody, then he was in a really bad mood. <laughs> and, and, but there are actually, some of the other sources are more positive. In fact, one of the sources argues that the reason he tries to kill all the gentry is actually from when he was a kid, his father was a traveling merchant. And he went to a village in uh, Sichuan and was, was selling his goods. And apparently the father's donkey relieved himself outside of gentry the person's house, the guy came out and stepped in it and made John's father clean it up with his hands and, and clean his feet and everything with his hands. So John said, one day I'm going to come back and I'm going to kill you and everyone in this province. <laughs> and so, of course, th th this is the apocryphal story of why he hates the gentry. Um, there are probably any more legitimate reasons, but there's a lot of great folklore surrounding it. And so Yellow Tiger was one of his nicknames, the eighth great king, 
from reference to a Buddhist uh, deity, uh, the Butcher of Sichuan is his other nickname. So, you can see him looking quite heroic and dashing there. Um, so I'm going to say just a few things about um, the types of sources that I'm using, and you'll hear some, some examples of these uh, later. Um, you know, classic stuff, the official histories, official reports, government chronicles. So you've obviously got the Ching Shu Lu, the Ching Shu Gao, a while later, the you know, official Ming sources, the Ming Ching Shirley Out collection, which you know, was published by the Academia Sinica, ton of material on the Ming Ching transition, you know, which is very, very rich material. Um, you've got um, so that sort of government chronicles and official sources. Uh, you've got field reports and memorials. So the Ming Ching Shirley Out collection has a lot of these. This summer, I was able to go to the National Library of China and look at the only copy in the world of Li Guoying's collected memorials. Li Guoying was a former Ming general who defects to the chain in 1647. It served under General Zhou Liang Yu, a very famous guy, and a staunch foe of Zhang Shenzhong, by the way. And so Li Guoying, his collected memorials are 16th to 24th January. Two boxes full of stuff, just incredibly rich. And so I was able to go through, well, most of them. They only let me look at the stuff for three days. Yes. It's a rare book. And so they would only give you three days to look at it. So I could read everything in the fine tooth comb. But, um, but you know, really, really rich material. Um, one of the other sources I looked at in Beijing, which I think there are two copies in the world, was a guy who was an aide de camp to Wu San Wei. And his sort of record of Wu San Wei's pacification of Sichuan before Wu rebelled. So it was a very positive Wu San Wei account, because it's before he became an enemy of the chain. Uh, another one is by an anonymous guy who lived in Yunnan, so he talks about the main peasant rebels moving in in Yunnan. And it's very interesting because in that account, which is called Genko Jiwe, you know, the account of the bandits in Yunnan, um, initially he sort of talks about the, the viciousness of the bandits. Like the, the one city, that the bandits warn them that this is Zhang Shenzhong's sons, his adopted sons. They warn these people not to resist in the city that they're moving into. And the people resist, so the bandits go in and they kill basically everybody. Men, women, children, young and old. The bodies were supposed to be piled up five feet high. The blood was three to four inches deep, ran across the uh, you know, entire city. So, so they, they try to make an example. So the next village, they again resist, and they can't believe it. So they cut all the arms off the men. And then the women, uh, some of the women were raped, some of them were allowed to live. The children were made servants of the army. Boys between 12 and 20 were castrated and made eunuchs. But then, after this, the people stopped resisting and they became close to the bandits, according to the source. And so that they, the bandits were harsh, but they also defended the people. Once the people didn't resist them anymore, they would defend them. And so they said, by the end, after three, four years of their administration, even a dog or chicken could walk the streets without fear. Because the bandits, the order, the order was so good that, they, that these guys kept. So it's very interesting, you know, this is a primary chronicle, you know, an anonymous chronicle from, from Yunnan in this period. So, so you've got field reports, memorials, you've got these private histories, and so some of them are diaries, some of them are memoirs. And as Lynn Struve has pointed out in her research on the Southern Ming, in general, the more personal stuff comes from the Ming side, the more official stuff comes from the Qing side. It's not entirely that way, but for the most part, the stuff you get from the Qing are these kind of reports of banditry, of false officials, and you get a sense of how they were viewing the process of conquest. Where on the other side, you get these kind of desperation accounts, and these pers accounts of personal trauma written by sons, grandsons, in some cases, the actual survivors. So it's, a, it's sort of interesting uh, contrast. So you have the memoirs. Um, one of the other really interesting sort of accounts we have, or one of the other perspectives, are from the Jesuits. And um, so there were Jesuits, obviously, at the, at the court of Beijing, but also there were some Jesuit missionaries in <coughs> Sichuan. And so when Zhang Shenzhong took over Chengdu and made himself Prince of the West, there were two Jesuit missionaries, uh, uh, Louis, Ludovico Buglio and Gabriel de Mandelhaas. And these guys served him as astronomers for like three years, or two and a half years, the whole time. They were eventually captured by the Manchus. And so they wrote an account of their time under Zhang Shenzhong's captivity. And um, it was originally written in Portuguese, and the original was held in the Vatican. But in the 60s and 70s, a Jesuit a scholar translated it into English. And so, and there's a copy of that translation at the Ricci Institute at the University of San Francisco. So this summer, I went out there 
and uh, many of you go to San Francisco. So um, you know, I went out there and I was able to look at this uh, this chronicle, and from the Jesuit perspective, it's very interesting because on the one hand, some of John Shenzhou's excesses are laid bare. He flayed people alive. He rewarded people for bringing him severed heads and feet and arms, his, you know, supposedly piles of body parts outside his palace. He later became very paranoid. He started. You know, supposedly seeing ghosts being attacked by spirits in the night. Um, you know, and they talk about this. But they also said, you know, he was a smart guy. At times they were saying, you know, if he if properly guided, he could become a true emperor of China. I mean, they have positive things to say about him, too. And it's, it's not all negative. And he has a lot of interesting questions. He's interested in astronomy. He's interested in scientific technology. He's interested in military technology. And so you get a very interesting kind of balanced portrayal of this guy, but you also see how things go downhill relatively quickly. But the fascinating source these, these Jesuit things, and, and, uh, and to add to that, and there's some other Chinese accounts you know, written by the Jesuits or about the Jesuits, I haven't had a chance to go through them all yet. There are a couple of books that are Chinese as well, I'll spend some more time looking at. And of course, I've talked about the folklore a little bit already, so it's too much time. But, um, and so um, I'm going to show you a couple more images and then get into uh, some of the passages. So this is Tongyuan Gate, which is in Chongqing. And uh, Chongqing has two partially preserved Ming gates. And so Tongyuan was the one that Zhang Shenzhong enters the city through when he captures and butchers the population of Chongqing in summer of 16, spring summer of 1644. And it's interesting because he goes through this place called Fortu Pass, which is now, the city is so much bigger now, the city of Chongqing is so much bigger than it was in the Ming, where the Ming was just in the island of the middle. So now Fortu Pass is a subway stop. And I was like, oh, I'm going to go to Fortu Pass. And it's just this you know, park, and there's a subway station there. But, but when you get up there, you can see it's the highest point in the city. So you can see that's why the rebels would go in there. But they actually breached the Tongyuan Gate. And what they've done here is they've created these armies attacking Tongyuan Gate. And they've got stories of the great sieges of Chongqing. Well, one of them during the Song Yuan War is this one. The other one's older. I can't remember what the other one was. But, uh, but I was mostly interested in the Zhang Shenzhou stuff. But you can see these soldiers, like these are life size, attacking the gate. And so you've got guys crawling up. And there's guys, you can see guys on top there. They've got guys on top with arrows, guys dropping rocks on people. There's some dead bodies scattered around. It's, 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 uh, it's pretty neat, actually. Uh, you know, this is the commander. So sending the troops mm -hmm. out. That pillar, there's, right and there's, the, there's the main wall itself, and you can see the high-rise apartments right there. Mm -hmm. but, uh, yeah, this is the view from the top. See the guys shooting up at you. Yeah, and then these, are, they've got these little, um, little sections here that sort of explain the different sieges that they're supposed to be depicting. And so this is Zhang Shenzhong's attack on, uh, on Chongqing. And so you can see the soldiers there. And there's a close up of Zhang himself, and the big beard and the spear. So then this thing, this wall here is probably 12 feet long. This is this one. This is uh, these are coins from his regime, mm -hmm. uh, which are the, the Dashun, the great pacification told out. And so these are from. Uh, I think these are, I got these pictures off the web, but they have some of the three gorges we see in And uh, this, John was, uh, was deified as, as an incarnation of Wen Chang in, uh, in a temple northwest of Chengdu, Zivong Temple. I did not have a chance to get out there because I couldn't find good information about exactly where it was. And one does not just travel randomly around Sichuan looking for temples, you know, where Statues of John Shenzhong. Um, I'll tell you my story of finding his grave in a second. But, then, but this again is an image of him, and so you can see the big beard and sort of the hat and all that stuff. And so then, this is actually, this is uh, Mount Fenghuang, which is where John was killed and buried by the Manchus. And um, so this was quite an interesting adventure, because we, we, my wife and I went out to Xichong County, which is pretty remote, a couple of hours by the fast train from Chengdu, northeast of Chengdu in the you know, wilderness of Sichuan. And um, so, because I read, you know, and, and this is, to so those of you who should, you should do research on the internet, be very careful. I've read on the internet that there was a martyr shrine to Zhang Shenzhong that had 
been set up in the 1980s. You know, and so I'm like, okay, well, let's see if I can find this martyr shrine to Zhang Shenzhong. And I knew he had been killed at Fang Huang. All the primary sources said that. And they actually said when his, when, they, when his grave was made, a black tiger guarded the grave and that thorns grew all around it so that no one could disturb his evil rest. Um, so I'm like, well, I gotta find this and, and, and you know, see what this is like. And then I, I was all excited because it was supposed to be a martyr shrine. So we, we go out to Xichang, we, we take the train, we get off in this cab and we tell the cab driver, we're looking for Chang Shenzhong's grave. He goes, yeah, I think I know where that is. That's up on Mount Fang Wang. Mm -hmm. And we're like, do you know how to get there? Maybe. <laughs> and, and so, so we're like, okay, well, we're going to go to the hotel. We're going to see if we can get some information there. And then we're going to call you. So he gives us his card. And so we go to the hotel, and I, I, I open the guidebook in my hotel, the, the, the Mount Fang Wang Hotel, the nicest hotel in Xichol, you know, 160 RMB a night or whatever. And um, you know, four-star accommodations, uh, well, sort of. But, um, so I get there and I, I open it up and it's like, you know, Zhang Xianzhong Martyr Tomb, located on Mount Feng Huang. And I see there's like the goat and stuff. I'm like, this is it, this is it. And I'm telling my wife, we gotta go now, because the weather could be bad tomorrow. You can see it's nice nice day. Um, so like, we gotta go, it's, it's only three in the afternoon, we can go. So we call the cabbie and he comes up and gets us. And he's like, all right. And so he takes us there. And so we go up this winding mountain path. It's a part dirt road, part regular road. We get up top of this mountain, there's this Buddhist monastery, this temple. And, and like a Buddhist retreat, and so there's not many people around. We go out, and there's this old lady in the front, and we're like, we're looking for Chang Shenzhong's grave. She said, who? He said, well, it's, it's supposed to be here. There's like a martyr shrine. She goes, I don't think there's a martyr shrine, but there's, there, I think there's some old grave back there. And she wasn't really sure. She goes, well, go this way. So we go one way, and it's dead end. So we go back up, go back around this temple, go back on this other dirt road, and come around. And so then we get out, and we're at this temple, and a couple of people come up to us. And of course, I'm an oddity because I'm you know, not alive. Although they told me I was the second important Mao Wai to come to Xichong this year. You know, Arnold Schwarzenegger had been there earlier. <laughs> so, uh, so it was me and Arnold were the, were the two. And um, so we go in and we ask, and I said, oh yeah, I think it's over there. Look at the Bao An. So they get the Bao An, the security officer, to come out. And he's like, oh yeah, you want to see John Shenzhong's grave? He goes, a lot of people, he goes, not a lot, some people go to see that. You're the first foreigner who's ever wanted to find this. I said, do you know where it is? He goes, yes, I do. <laughs> and he goes, and I'll take you. And because um, and there was a gate and stuff, so we had to unlock this gate and go up this long path. And I'm like, I'm getting really excited about this. And so here's the view as we're going up the path. And there it is. <laughs> there was, the internet was not exactly accurate <laughs> in, their, in their explanation of what I was going to find there. And if you can't quite see it in the picture, if you look really close, it says John Shenzhong's grave. <laughs> you know, in grave but clearly, somebody had been burning incense. Um, whether that was to keep him from coming back or to placate him or what, I don't know. Um, but, but so this, this was it. I found it. And um, that was kind of, it was sort of anticlimactic. Um, and then I was like, well, can you take my picture? And they're like, no. <laughs> and so we do not take pictures of people with graves. Well, no. Never. Bad luck. <laughs> and so none of the people with me would take a picture with the grave. I said, bad luck. No way will we take your picture with this grave. So alas, you just have to trust that I took this picture and I was actually there. Um, but, but then we're like, well, maybe there's some records. Because there been a conference in the 80s about the peasant rebels in Xichon, in the city. So, so the cabbie, by this point, he's really invested in us. Our cabbie, he had left, got us water, came back after we had done our trip. And he's like, I'll, I'll take you back. And he's like, you don't even have to pay me. This is so interesting. And um, so he's driving us around. The, so we go to a bunch of bookstores in Xichong, can't find anything. And finally, somebody's like, you should go to the Dang you should go to the Xian Zhengfu. They probably have something there. So the next day, we went to the county government <laughs> office and um, you know, asked a few questions, went to, uh, saw this, um, this person who's working in some office and she's like, who? I don't know. So then she makes a couple phone calls and she's like, oh yeah, we got this book of county folklore that we published last year. And we don't sell it or anything, but we just give it away to people. So here it is. And <laughs> there were like five stories about John Shenzhou in there, all of which were positive, interestingly enough, about his good relationship with the Xi people, playing nurse to young children back to health. All these other sort of interests. So that's what I ended up finding in Xichong. But not as much about the blood and stuff. So it was an interesting trip, nonetheless. But, um, so, so that's a little sort of personal stuff. Now I'm going to get into, I mean, yeah, I'm going to some time, into some of the actual stories and stuff. Um, essentially what happens is that, um, as you may know, right, the Manchus have taken Nanjing and they're, they're consolidating control over the southeast. 
the southwest of China, they had largely left alone because it was really utter chaos. There were so many different political actors and it was so remote that the sort of Manchu leadership, early on they had attempted to try to take it. They were going to send uh, Wu San Wei in there. And the problem was he didn't have enough food, he didn't have enough of the supply line. And um, so he was very wary about pressing deeply into Sichuan because of the, uh, the political situation. And uh, so you had essentially a number of different power contenders. In many ways, those of you who um, you know, watch Game of Thrones, you've read the books, right? This is Game of Thrones without all that gentility. <laughs> uh, you know, much bloodier, much more violent, but you've got steaming eunuchs, you've got you know, dwarfs, you've got cannibals, you've got people flayed alive, you've got all of it. And um, so the political situation is very fluid because you've got the Qing forces, you've got the Manchu forces and their Chinese allies. You've got the Ming loyalist courts. You've got independent warlords. Some of, sometimes support the Qing, sometimes the Ming, sometimes themselves. And you've got the remnant armies of Zhang Shanzhou and the remnant armies of Li Zichang, the other best relative. So you've got all these actors running back and forth. So what the people eventually do is, it's very interesting to see what the ordinary people are doing. Some of them just, they move up into the mountains and they build these stockades. So the mountains are filled with these armed, literally armed camps of people who just, anyone comes there, we shoot them. And, and we, we go out in armed bands and, and, and it's very, and, the, and when you read both the Ming and the Qing source, they talk about this in Andrew's book. These armed bands are everywhere. Everybody's armed, it's armed camp everywhere. And, and we can't make any progress. And so farming has broken down. Um, you know, there, there's drought in Sichuan, but Yunnan seemed to be better. Yunnan and Guizhou didn't have the drought. But Sichuan had tremendous drought. They had epidemics. And they, they talk about tiger attacks, leopard attacks, wolf attacks, wild dog attacks, um, as well as you know, monsters and animals. And um, so there's, there's a tremendous social breakdown. And the sources talk about this, like one source says, you know, there was a, you know, from Chengdu for 70 li, the, litter, the ground was littered with bones. It was nothing but white. Bones that were rotting corpses. You know, the, the graves were full. Nine out of 10 homes were empty. Li Guoying repeatedly, he says it so much, it just because you just see it again and again in his reports, he says for a thousand li, there were no cooking fires because you know, there were no people. Um, you know, so there are all these, these, uh, these accounts of, of the savagery and sort of how this kind of connects to uh, you know, social breakdown. You know, some of the later diaries, they talk about the fact that people couldn't bury relatives. So they were, their, their ancestors, you know, their family members were wandering as ghosts because their bodies were not properly buried. Or they had been dismembered. Like John loved to dismember and cut people up, as did some of the other peasant brothers. And this was a problems for the body and the afterlife and all that stuff together. And um, so you know, the accounts talk about this. You know, families disunited, women being raped, you know, children being you know, killed. Um, cannibalism, there are repeated accounts of cannibalism, which I'll get into in a second. And so I'm going to give you a few examples of these and, so, and then touch on some of these other points in a second. So, as, um, here's one account. Um, villages were empty, and for hundreds of li there were no people. Subjects fled deep into the mountains. Those who could not eat to survive piled up in ravines. Some ate grass and leaves. And those still alive became wild people, living in forests and growing coats of white fur. If they happened to meet someone along the road, they would kill them and drink his blood. And that account is from Wang Fuzhou, a you know, you know, famous Ming loyalist scholar. It's from the Yongli Shilu. And um, you know, it's a very interesting you know, detail, right? And there are other accounts that I'll get to in a second. But one of, one of the things that's striking about this is the, you know, the, the, the white fur. I did a talk a couple of years ago at a conference, and a medical uh, person came up and they said, you know, growing white hair is a sign of malnutrition. And, uh, you know, people with anorexia and stuff sometimes have this condition. And I said, so this could actually be a reflection of some reality that people are starving and going out and want their blood drinking. But the, um, but certainly that, uh, that account there. Um, Um, okay, um, this is the, the guy, uh, Li Furong, whose account I read at the beginning, the Chaos and Order. He says, nowhere was the poison of the bandits more severe than in Sichuan. In the wake of the bandits came tigers and wolves. Famine spread everywhere, and as a result, epidemics broke out. Thus, the bones piled up like mountains and blood flowed like rivers. Although it is said there are heavenly spirits, who knows where they go in the face of such calamity and chaos. That's a line from uh, Kevin. Uh, 
And um, you know, so th there are other accounts of people reverting to uh, the uh, savagery. Um, like Yuan Mei, the famous writer of the early uh, Qing period, actually talks about he talks about the hairy people of Qin, who were supposedly descended from the people who fled building the Great Wall. And so and some people suspect that it may be one of the bases for the Yeren stories in China today in that part of the country. Although conveniently, Yuan Mei tells us if you're ever confronted by a Yeren or you know, Yeti or whatever, there's a, there's a foolproof way to get rid of them. You just yell, build a great wall, <laughs> and they'll run away. And so just remember that. <laughs> confronted by the Yeren in, in, the, in the countryside. Um, also, very interesting are the discussion of tigers and tiger attacks. And of course, your tigers are not, you know, there aren't many, if there are any tigers left in China today, they're probably in Siberia or Manchuria. But at this time, there were still a fair number of tigers in South China, South Central China. And what's interesting, I did some research on tiger behavior and tiger subspecies when I was working on this. And I found out that supposedly the South China subspecies of tiger is among the most aggressive and most notorious man-eaters of all the different subspecies of tigers. And, um, and so there were some great accounts of, uh, of these tiger attacks. So some of the people have argued that maybe they're overblown. I mean, there, are, there are discussions of tigers swimming and attacking people in boats. Tigers do swim. Uh, there, were there were mentions of tiger packs, which doesn't make sense because tigers are not lions, right? They're not packing animals. They climb trees, there are accounts of that, there are accounts of climbing into houses. So people would travel abroad in large groups with fire to keep the tigers away. Uh, leopards as well. The leopard will attack a group, they'll just take the weakest one. So, a helpful fact for you. Uh, so, never be the weakest one if you're in leopard territory. Uh, but, let's see, we've got a great quote. And, and the tiger, in traditional uh, Chinese, uh, Conceptualization. Sometimes the tiger is an agent for good, an agent of righteousness. Other times it's a symbol of savagery and chaos. And so some of these sources say, you know, there were a lot of tigers because the government couldn't keep order. Then when they restored order, the tigers went away. But also, in terms of animal behavior, it's like the fact that there were so many decaying bodies, so many unburied bodies, that's where the tigers were coming in easy food. And we know this in contemporary accounts of Iraq, of uh, you know, World War II, India, tigers coming in and eating the corpses of British soldiers talk about this. Place. So that, that actually makes perfect sense in terms of tiger behavior. They develop a taste for human flesh, easy human flesh. But I've got some great uh, figures for this from one of the uh, Qing officials. Thank you. Okay, yeah, this is, uh, this account is from uh, <clears throat> the pacification commissioner of Sichuan, Zhang Chun, from the sixth month of 1650. He begins his account by describing Sichuan as a den of tigers and a haven of chaos caused by the Yao Huang bandits. These are the guys descended from Lisa Chun's organization. After noting one can traverse a great distance without even seeing smoke from cooking fires. This is a common thing. You see it so many times. It just depends on how many li. Some guys it's a thousand li, some guys it's 300 li, some guys it's 100 li. But in any case, you can go a long ways without seeing cooking fires. And he says, um, he says, only two to three percent of the population of Sichuan was still alive. This is in 1650. Right? And while he blames a lot of the destruction on the Yao Huang bandits and this exculpates the chain from blame, he then gives information about the reports of man-eating tigers that came to his attention when he took up his post. He notes that the people feared to travel because of the prevalence of tigers. In one district, out of a previous population of 506, 228 were killed by tigers. 55 died of illness. Just 223 were left alive. Uh, in another place, 42 out of 74 inhabitants were eaten by tigers, according to John. Some people were reported to be eaten by tigers in broad daylight while working in their fields. Uh, so, and then he ends his report with saying, many people escape the clutches of bandits only to end up in the mouths of tigers. You know, we have to do something about this, this is report to his chief superiors. And you know, so, you know, just you know, fascinating um, you know, account of you know, the descent of savagery. And it's not just the tigers, right? They also speak of widespread cannibalism. And um, you know, accounts of, you know, and, and one, one source is very, um, let's see if I can find it. Um, yeah. And one source, it says, uh, years of famine. One source, chillingly, and just sort of laconically accounts. Because of the long period of disorder, the cattle were all gone. So people replaced cattle as food. You know, and, and those of you who have read these, so the, a lot of times you see that red shang right? People hate each other. Um, you see that a lot. 
Um, in some sources, they give the they give the going rate for human flesh in the markets, like how much people were paying for it, and what the different euphemisms were, like special lamb, special dog meat, that sort of thing. So that you know, if you wanted to you know, pick up your uh, your human flesh, um, and let's say um, okay, a peck of rice. This is an eligible product. A peck of rice sold for ten thousand cash. Because there was nothing to eat in the wild, when bandits spotted a person, they ate him. And because fires could be seen a great distance at night, people would sneak up and ambush and eat you. So people started eating without using cooking fires, because they didn't want to attract attention to them. Some feared to enter dwellings for fear they'd be ambushed and eaten. Parents, children, and spouses would make meals of their deceased relatives. Other people got in trouble for you know, basically cutting up corpses that they found on the road. Um, you know, so some people, as I mentioned, moved into stockades. Others supposedly went feral. People near Shujo reportedly fled into the mountains and learned to walk with such light steps that it seemed like they flew. And they eventually took to living in the trees. Um, and so it was you know, really interesting accounts. You've know, got mixed fact, fact and fantasy in these, uh, in these uh, discussions. Um, and then sort of later, they talked about the, the general depopulation of Sichuan. So for example, when Wu San Wei um, enters Chongqing in 1658, he says, the war ravaged land was filled with nothing but ghost towns. As we approached Chongqing, corpses and bones were strewn alongside the road, and only mountain flowers grew. The only sound emanating from the eaves of houses was the sound of cuckoos. And so this is, you know, this is 1658, so it would have been almost 10 years after John Kennedy went back. But, um, so very interesting discussion of you know, how trauma and how traumatized people are in terms of you know, social breakdown, so like animals and monsters. Ghosts, there are a lot of ghost stories too. And you know, the spirits are interesting in that sense. So, um, so there's a couple more images here. I don't have a little bit of time, but but uh, this is actually, I, I just, this is a nice image. But this is a sort of a female warrior, an Aboriginal chieftain named Chin Lian Yu, who was uh, very prominent in the 17th century. And in fact, I found this at the Three Gorges Museum. I found out that they used part of her uniform as one of the insignia for the Beijing Olympics a few years ago. But she, uh, she was noted for keeping her territory free of the outside bandits because she was so ferocious as a, as a female warrior. And she, she had inherited the position from her husband, he died, and she became two so This is her sword, this is her helmet, they've got her armor there. They also apparently put her likeness on cigarettes, and so there were cigarettes they sold in the 30s, Chin Young Yu brand cigarettes. And so I'm thinking about doing an article on her, she's really interesting. She keeps popping up sort of in stuff I do, um, even though she's not a main character. This is a cannon in uh, Chongqing that was supposed to be used to unsuccessfully defend the city from Zhang Shenzhong. The Ming era cannon. These are Yongli coins. He was the last Southern Ming emperor. So these, are just, these are from the same museum. It's the Three Gorges Museum. This, these are also John's coins. He's Prince of the West, so these are Zhang Shenzhong coins. Xi Wang. And that's one of the things that's interesting about it is that all these rebel regimes, when they set themselves up, they mint coins, they establish offices, they put out seals, and they really try to legitimize themselves. And you know, the, the peasants in particular, they talk about how they created commerce, and they really wanted the people to do well, and, and things like that, especially in Yuna. Sun Kawan in particular gets credit for that. Um, and this is Sun Kawan's coin. And so he set himself up as, as ruler. He was Zhang Shenzhou's eldest adopted son. That's so this coin from his regime of Yuna. He eventually affects the shape. And so um, I've talked about a lot of this already, so just a uh, kind of recap in terms of the overall implications, destruction of family, destruction of agriculture, and there's a lot of discussion of that in the Qing sources, like how they're going to restore agriculture, what they have to do. Um, famine, disease, and the sources go into detail about the types of diseases that people have to talk about tigers, militarization in general, and sort of trauma, you know, the people that survive and how they remember. Some people seem guilty about surviving. Others, you know, sort of extol the loss to Ming. Others say, well, it's because of the Qing bringing the order. Thank God we have the Qing now. And uh, things are better. And so these are sort of some of the general implications that I'm, I'm working on in the, uh, in the research as a whole. Okay, and this is just the route of the, the Yongli Emperor's flight. He eventually is captured by Wu Sanwei in Burma. And his last sort of loyal general, Li Ding, was my, probably my favorite figure in all of Chinese history. He dies of, of disease trying to save Yongli and eventually you know, dies in the wilderness of uh, 
and, and, and tells his son and his, his, his best, his, his former friend's son, whatever you do, never submit to the chain. You know, die fighting for the main. Like two weeks later, they submit to the chain. And they, they get princesses and they all move to Beijing and they have nice lives. But, um, but, but Li Dingguan never did it. And, and so he's remembered today as a great loyal hero, whereas his brother, his adopted brother, who defects to the chain, He's listed in the traitor biographies of the Qing history. <laughs> because he was a traitor to the Ming, even though he served the Qing. Li Dingguo did not. And so here's a modern image of Li Dingguo, the dashing Prince Jin. And he's also immortalized in folklore because there is a Li, there is a Prince Jin chicken dish that you can get in Yunnan. And you can find it on the internet. Jin Lam Ji Ying. And it's pretty good. My wife made it for me. We found the recipe on QQ or whatever. You know, made it. It's chicken with pears and stuff. And it's a tribute to my, my personal hero, Li Dingguo. Who, and what's interesting about him, and a lot of these figures, is that these guys were peasants, but they were literate. I mean, they talk about him reading classics of strategy. He wrote letters to the Shinga. He wrote letters to the only emperor. He, he played Chinese chess. He does all the things. Zhang Shenzhong was literate. Li Zhang was literate. So I don't know what the school systems were like in Shanxi in the 1620s that all these peasants were getting an education. But um, it, it's pretty amazing. Or maybe it's just because these guys are the best ones. But there were a number of these peasants from rural Shanxi that were all literate, which is pretty surprising, actually. That's a total side note. And so um, in terms of the overall uh, project, I think I've talked about this a lot, but you know, things I'm looking at from the perspective, Ming versus Chain, others. The theme of chaos and order, chaos and disorder, how it plays out in Chinese history. Um, you know, the notion of dynastic loyalty. And, and that one is very interesting, because some people are clearly loyal to one side or the other. Others seem loyal to order. It doesn't really matter. And, and there were certain officials, one of these authors, he served three different peasant rebel leaders, two Qing leaders, the Yongli Emperor, and a couple of warlords in the course of his career. So it was like, you know, and, and, he, and he says, hey man, I had to feed my family. That's kind of his, that's kind of his justification. And, um, but it's interesting because he clearly did not have this sort of, uh, I've got to be loyal to the main. But other people you know, were seemingly steadfastly loyal to one side or the other, and they have tended to come down, um, you know, in the modern sense, those people have tended to come across better what we did want. Um, and then the other mention, the other thing I just want to touch on right here at the end is this universal elements and how you can, you can find other places, other wars, other times, and find similar sort of responses. You know, this militarization, this survival ethic, this notion of loyalty, this notion of clan and family loyalty. Although in the Chinese case, it does get a little you know, different when you're talking about things like filial piety and you know, you know, ancestors. Uh, Lynn Struve, a few years ago, did an article called Confucian PTSD. And, and argues that Chinese culture produces a specific kind of trauma. And so I'm trying to figure out if I can work with that, and I'm not quite sure yet. And a, a lot of the trauma and memory studies have been focused on more modern conflicts. So you can't always make a one-to-one -one, you know, analogy. You know, talk about things like the Holocaust and stuff. And you know, these are equally traumatic events for you know, people in this, in this setting. So there's a lot of universal stuff that hopefully we have.